So we're looking at another part of the series, and this time we're going to be focusing on taking notation. And I want to hit on the number one errors that I've seen students make when learning notation, as well as errors that people make when they take notation for a tournament. Because maybe you guys noticed when we did the activity last class, but it takes away from your game if you're focusing too much on the notation. Because you're focused so much on getting it right, you like lose a piece or do something stupid because you're not focused. So it's an important element that like the tournament that we're preparing for, it's going to have time controls that's 25 minutes per player with a five second delay. And keep in mind, we talked about different time controls and things when we went over tournament rules. And that's also in the one of the previous videos. But with thinking about everything in the process with a tournament. You have long enough to write down your moves. And we discussed this in the tournament rules video, but you make your move, you press the clock, then write it down. Because you're taking time to write down on their time. And also keep in mind, don't get stressed out about notation if you mess it up on your score sheet. Because you can ask to borrow your opponent's score sheet as long as it's on your time. And, I mean, 90% of the time, people are like, yeah. I mean, sometimes people are like, mm-mm, you know? Like, I mean, I, I do that one time just for one second just to mess with them, but then I'll give it to them because I'm just playing around. But, like, legitimately, there's no reason not to let them see your score sheet. You can't be doodling on it. You can't be making notes to yourself on it. You can't go back and look at previous games. Um... They've actually, in uh, national scholastic events at this point, they've outlawed notation books where some people like to have the book that had like 50 score sheets in it or 100, but people could flip back and look in it, so they consider that written help. Um, one of the, the USCF rules is you cannot have written help during a game. So it's important to understand that even making like a motivational quote or something on the back of your paper is considered written help, which at this point, to me, it should extend to listening to music and things of that nature. But not all tournament directors will say you can't listen to music. Um, I don't allow it if the opponent complains during a game. That's my rule. If your opponent doesn't care, cool. You can, you know, get vibes and stuff. But uh, if he does, no music. That's why if you like having something in your ears or drowning out noise, I recommend earplugs. So, okay, going forward, talking about notation a little bit further. First of all, I wanted to show, you know, standard score sheet. And this is typically what we use in tournament play. And it just makes it a lot easier, especially if you're a TD. I just put two standard score sheets on a normal sheet of paper and that way you're getting two to a sheet of paper makes it easy to print out you don't have to worry about it because those carbon copy score sheets they're thicker and they're typically more expensive so that's the cheapo option and number one mistakes that I see first and foremost with students taking notation one they don't write down both their move and their opponents move how can you look over the game if you only wrote down half of it that's like telling half the story or skipping every other minute in a movie. It's not going to make much sense. So we need to write down both moves. That's the starting point. Now we need to understand notation. We'll go, well, Mr. Tillis, um, king is K, but knight is N. Why do we do that? It would be a little bit confusing if we were using two Ks. Even though knight is spelled with a K, obviously. King is K, knight is N, bishop's B, queen is Q, rook is R, and pawns, they get no respect. I mean, so, that being the case, you got to have props, you do. So, let's break down first, when writing notation properly, what's capitalized and what's lowercase? Pieces get respect, uppercase, squares, lowercase. Pieces are stepping on them, lowercase. So we'll make a few moves, and we'll see the notation here. Remember, pawns get no respect. So when we're moving a pawn, we don't write P. 
it's just going to be e4 in this case. Now, let's get to some capturing. And this isn't going to be the best opening in the world, just to emphasize multiple captures and what it looks like. So we have d5. And I'm just going to move these knights out. Now, the next part of notation, after understanding that, say, when we move our knight out here, that's capital N, lowercase c3, and then capital N, lowercase f6. So pieces are capitalized, squares are lowercase. We got that so far. Next, capturing. In this case, when a piece captures, not a pawn, but a piece captures something, we take the piece, in this case, capital N, knight, X captures, and this is the D5 square. So N, X, D5. Like if the queen takes, which would be a terrible move here, that'd be capital Q, X, D5. Now my pawn can take the queen, right? So that would be, we're on the E file, that is an E pawn, lowercase E, X, D5. So far so good with capturing? Okay. So let's roll it back. And we have a few symbols we need to talk about. So if I come and let's say I have this position. And I move my bishop out and it checks his king. Notice we write the move the same as we normally do. Bishop b5, but check is plus, and you just simply write it after the move. Okay, not too hard. What about checkmate? Got to have your hashtags. So I'm going to go forward, and this time I'm just going to do a basic checkmate here. Black wasn't paying attention, and this is one of the fastest ways to lose a game. Queen takes f7. So we've got capital Q, X, lowercase f7, and then hashtag is mate. All right. So again, with the symbols, with check and checkmate, you're simply writing it after the moves. So we've covered captures, check and checkmate, and one more checkmate just for bonus. Does anybody know the fastest checkmate in here? How many moves does it take? I just showed you one in four. Any guesses? Uh-huh. Three? Two? Two. Okay, we, get, we got one vote for three and two votes for two. So let's see if we can do this. Now remember we've talked about the weakest part of a camp to start off with is the F-pawns, right? Because only the king defends it. So what if white just starts moving pawns and open up his king to start with? And I'm going to move my pawn up, and then white goes, Waha! Well, you just got checkmated. And this is why I tell you guys to castle as quickly as possible. Checkmate because nothing can block. And again, in notation, that's capital Q, H4, with hashtag. And for the older generation, that's the pound sign on the phone. I didn't even know what a hashtag was until I got an Instagram. So, generation gaps. Well, we've got some symbols so far. Now, let's talk about castling when we get our king safe. So we're going to keep it simple. And has it been shown? Okay, yeah, it's been showing us. It's been changing. Good. So knight of three, knight of six, and we've been working on basic openings too, so I want to build a house, live in it, and get my king safe. Three principles of a good opening. Keeping our king safe, which normally means castling. Maintaining a pawn in the center, get some central control, and develop our knights and bishops effectively. Meaning, attacking the center or attacking our opponent's pieces that are attacking the center. You accomplish these three things, typically you got a good opening, and you can do it in less than 10 moves. Remember, if a chess game is 30 moves and you learn an opening, you already have mastered one-third of the game of chess. So, after checkmates, openings. Get you something so you're not getting killed by one of these that I just showed you, you know. Because if you have no idea what you're doing in the beginning of the game, you can get murderized. And that just doesn't need to happen. So I'm going to build a little house. 
I'm going to build another house here. Then I'm going to put my bishop in it. I live in it. Now I'm ready to castle. So the symbol for castle and kingside, I'm going to go one, two, put the rook over. I got circle, dash, circle. Huh. Do it over here. Circle, dash, circle. And notice, each time I'm writing down both moves, white and black. And this is a common mistake, too, I see when students are learning notation. They will write the side of the board that they're on, on the left. White is always on the left. Black is always on the right when we write notation. It's like reading left to right. So remember it that way. And to complete an opening, let's go ahead and do a King's Indian attack. This is a confusing one. Notice, guys, that both knights can travel to d2. So we can't just write knight d2. That doesn't make much sense, because I don't know which one. So we need to write an extra letter when two of the same piece can go to the same square. In this case, it is knight b to d2 because we moved the B knight. If it was the other knight, it would be knight F to D2. Now C5, E4, knight C6, and we'll stop it there because generally we have ourselves pretty decent position, and we've seen another point in notation that people mess up. When two pieces, normally it happens with a knight or a rook, can go to the same square, we need to add an extra letter or number to signify. Because say two rooks are on the same file, well, we can't just write rook f, f7, because both are on the f. We write like rook 1, f7, or rook 8, f7, okay? Now let's see castle's queen side. And we will do another opening. And this is one of the most popular openings in chess. This is a Sicilian. Now, black is counterattacking in the center. Open Sicilian. We got knight takes d4. Knight f6 hitting the pawn. Knight c3 defending the pawn. And this is the knight orf Sicilian. Bishop comes out. Give him a little tickle tickle. He runs away. Moves the bishop out. Pawn comes up covering g4. Bishop comes out. Everybody's getting developed. Everybody's getting invited to the party. And now we've got Castle's Queen side. And when first students hear, oh, Castle's Queen side, I can castle my queen. No, 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 no. Castle's Queen side and Castle's King side are very similar. And let me use a move to emphasize. So in White's case here, the White King can castle in either direction. And remember our rules of castling. If the king has not moved, nor either rook has been moved, you can castle as long as you're not castling through check or trying to castle through your pieces. So we satisfy all criteria for castling here. Our king hasn't moved. Our rooks haven't moved. There's nothing in between our king and rooks. And no, nothing from our opponent's side of the board is attacking through the squares where we're castling or where our king is moving through. So it's 1-2, put the rook over when castling. And again, the symbol for castle king side is circle-circle. So 1-2, put the rook over. Same thing with castle and queen side. 1-2, put the rook over. And we add an extra dash circle for castle's queen side. Because I'm pretty sure it's the rook moved a little bit longer, so we write a little extra dash circle. Okay? That, double check my notes real quick. Uh, promotion is the last one that we can hit on. And I'm going to make a bunch of nonsensical moves, I think. Or, let's do it this way. Okay. 
We'll make it white to move from this position and black's getting wrecked. What would be the better move here? Push forward or take the knight? Okay, so we'll see two different ways to write promotion. First, let's see the simple way. If I just push the pawn forward, it just does h8 queen. I typically like to put a slash in there myself, but no matter what I get back, say I get a knight back, it would be h8 capital N. I get a rook back, h8 capital R. Okay, and if I take h takes g8 queen and typically you want to get a queen back because why it's the most powerful piece very good so the activity that we're going to be doing is i'm going to give you the first few moves you can practice writing them down to so say like a nice king's indian attack position and then you play a game from there you write it down you come to me we check it over um the great thing about the notation is you're able to look over your game and analyze your mistakes afterwards. Because much like history, a lot of things have been forgotten. If you don't write down the game or games, how can you learn from them? So notation is, is important. So even if you mess up the notation during the game and you're like, oh, my coach isn't going to be able to read this, ask your opponent. And if you don't have time to copy it down, almost every person in this room has a phone. Just ask to take a picture of their score sheet. And that way, we can look at the game and I can show you what you did wrong and you can get stronger. Because that is the number one way, in my opinion, to improve in chess, is to be able to analyze your games. Alright, that's it for this one.